Thanks everybody for joining this first episode in season one of Net DevOps Live. My name is Hank Preston and I will be your host for today's session on useful Python libraries for network engineers. Joining me on today's call are a handful of Cisco experts in programmability who will be handling question and answers. Please use the Q&A panel that you'll find inside of the WebEx events application to file questions and then our panelists can find those and answer them as they go through. Um, I'll handle the first question that usually comes up pretty quick. All of the resources shown in this presentation, including the code samples, the recording of the episode, um, all of those details are available at the end. We'll have links for all of those so that you can get access to them and we'll make sure that they're made available. And so without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and jump right into this first episode. So what exactly we're going to talk about today? So we're gonna go through four basic types of libraries inside of our presentation. We're gonna start out with libraries to work with data and data formats. As network engineers, we have to work quite a bit with different types of data depending on the APIs or the source files that we're working with. So we'll explore some of the common ones that we'll hit there. From there, we'll move on to the actual API calls that are API libraries to work with different APIs. So REST APIs, NetConf, RESTConf, uh, even talking about API or libraries available for CLI or SNMP types of interfaces. From there, we're gonna move away from kind of the direct kind of uh, atomic libraries for working with data or with APIs natively and talk about a handful of Python configuration management and automation frameworks that can be handy to use as network engineers. Then at the very end, we'll talk about a couple of cool uh, open source libraries and free availability uh, tools that you might be able to take advantage of as you journey through network programmability and net DevOps. All right, so libraries to work with data. Now, as you do your network automation, you're going to come across lots of different types of data formats that you have to work with. XML, JSON, YAML, CSV, and Yang are the ones we're going to go through. Now we will be starting out with XML and you may be saying, you know what, Hank, I don't really like XML. Do we have to learn how to work with it? And frankly, yes, we do. Um, one of the common and most or pervasive network configuration protocols today available about across vendors and platforms is NetConf. And NetConf works solely with XML. So we have to become comfortable working with it inside of our scripts. However, JSON is also a common one to go through. So we'll look at how we can work with JSON inside of our automation scripts and things like that. And then finally, we'll look at YAML, which for me is kind of the newest data format, but it's also the one that I've, I've kind of fallen in love with and find myself using more and more often, even outside of the, the common element where we find it, which is often with Ansible playbooks and working with things like that. After that, we're gonna turn our attention to CSV files. Now, CSV files have kind of been the network management storehouse for many of us for years, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. It may not start out as CSV files, but if you're using Excel spreadsheets or numbers or Google Docs with Google Sheets, converting that content into CSV files and then manipulating that through your Python scripts is a great skill to have. And then finally in this section, we're gonna dive into Yang data models and working with Yang data models. We'll talk a bit about what those are, but we're gonna be focusing a lot on how the PyYang or PyYang tool can be used to manipulate and work with those models that are there. So without further ado, we're gonna dive right into the XML libraries that are here. Now there is a native XML library for Python, it's just called XML, and it lets you work with and manipulate and build XML documents. But I find myself and most network engineers that I'm talking to not necessarily needing the full power of the, the XML library that comes through, which is why I was glad when I found the XML to dict library. When we're talking about XML, JSON, and YAML, our primary goal is to take that raw data format and convert it into a Python object that's easy to work with. And those tend to be things like dictionaries and lists that we go through. XML to dict just, does just what it says. It takes an XML string, like right, a, a XML document, and converts that into a Python dictionary. Specifically an ordered dictionary, because Python dictionaries natively don't maintain order of elements that are added, and XML does require us to maintain order as we go back and forth as it goes through. Now on the slide, we have a handful of examples here, but rather than look at those in slide format, let's actually see this in a bit of a live demo. So I've switched myself over here, and let me get my cursor where I need it. <clears throat> and I'm in my XML directory. And so inside of this directory, I've got two files, xmlexample.py and xmlexample.xml. If I look at the xmlexample.xml file, what we'll see is it's just a basic XML document. It's actually modeled after an IETF Yang, interfaces Yang model for describing what an interface looks like. 
And through, across XML, JSON, and YAML, we'll actually be looking at these same interface details, but modeled using the different data formats that are there. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open an IPython Python interactive interpreter so that I can type my Python commands as we go through. I'm using IPython here, but you could also use Python or IDLE or any type of interpreter you prefer. I like using IPython because of tab completion and some of the other features. So our first step is to import XML to dict. This is the library that we will be using as we go through. Now, once I've imported that in, I've got access to use it. Now, where we're going to get the XML details is from that XML, uh, ex XML example, that XML file we just looked at. I'm gonna use the with open command here to open that file up and create a, an object called F, which is a link to the file. And then I'm just gonna read the entire content of that into this XML example name. And so what that gives me, if I check the type of XML example, we'll see that I have a string and I can print that out and see that it's the exact same XML string that we looked at. Now I don't wanna work with it in raw string format. This is why we take advantage of the library XML to dict. And so what I'm gonna run is this command. I'm gonna create a new uh, variable called XML underscore dict, and I will use the XML to dict dot parse method and then pass it in the XML string. This will create an ordered dictionary. Now, as I mentioned, an ordered dictionary is used for XML because of the way that the XML data format functions is we have to maintain the actual uh, order of the elements that are inside of the library. But we work with it just like we would work with any other Python dictionary, which means I can come in and I can actually access the details out of that XML library using dictionary syntax. So I can go in and say XML dict, and then give me the interface key followed by the name key and store that as a new variable called int name, and then I can print it out, int name. And we can see that I quickly accessed it. I didn't have to do any parsing, I didn't have to do any searching. By using the XML to dict, all of that is done for me. Now oftentimes, we may need to pull in information from our network using a protocol like netconf, which is where this might have come from, and then we wanna update that detail. And so here we can see how I'm using um, the XML to dict object to actually change the IP address. The IP address was originally 172.16.02, and I'm gonna go ahead and update that to a 192.168 address. Now that updates it inside of Python, and if I needed to convert this back into XML so I could send this off to my network device, I can use the unparse method from XML to dict to reconvert this back. And I'll print the string back out, and we can see indeed, I've now updated my IP address inside of the XML. Now you'll notice that there's no carriage returns, it hasn't been cleaned up with indenting, and that's because XML as a data format doesn't require white space or any of that. Any of that that's built into the data that you look at is actually there so they make it easier for humans to read. The XML itself doesn't require it. So let's exit out of this one, and then we will return back to our slides to move on to what is probably the more popular data format these days, which is JSON. And so with JSON, JSON and Python actually work really well. Despite the fact that JavaScript object notation is what JSON stands for, I actually find it's easier to work with JSON inside of Python than it is to work with it inside of JavaScript. Now there's a built-in library called JSON that we can use with our Python, and then it has two methods that we'll commonly leverage, loads and dumps. The S at the end is for string, so that's load string or dump string. Load string takes JSON data as a string object and then converts that into a Python object, oftentimes dictionaries, but also lists depending on what was in the JSON ob data. And then json.dump string dumps will convert an object back into a raw JSON string. Just like we did with the XML, let's go ahead and actually see this in action. All right, so I'm going to change from the XML directory into my JSON directory. And we'll see that once again, I've got a JSON example.py and a JSON example.json. So I'll open up my IPython interpreter. And as before, we'll start out with importing in the library that we need. In this case, it is import JSON. And now, as we did before, we're gonna go ahead and read in that JSON examples um, text file that I'd saved out here called JSON example.json and then turn that into a string. Now often you would be using it, you would get the JSON data from an API call, either a REST API call or some other uh, example, but in this case we're just reading in and getting the JSON from our, our piece that's there. Now as before, we'll just see that JSON example is indeed a string, and if I print that out, oops, 
we can see that I've got my straw string object that's there. Now I will use the json.load command from the JSON library to actually bring this in and then convert it into a dictionary. Now in this case, JSON isn't order specific, so we don't have to maintain the order inside of the object, so it can just be a native Python dictionary as it goes through. Now from there, I can go ahead and grab int name equals JSON dict, and then use the same key. So interface will be my first one, and then uh, name will be the second, and then I can print out int name. And so I've now been able to very easily get access to the interface name that's there. Now you'll notice that the ways, the commands, the syntax that we're using, I match what we were working with with XML. And so in here, I can do that same command to go ahead and update the IP address that's built in that we got out of the JSON file. And then if we needed to revert this back into JSON to send it as a payload to an API request, we can use json.dumps and this will convert it back into JSON. And once again, we'll notice there's no indenting or carriage returns because JSON as a format doesn't require any of those. All right, so we've got that. Let's go ahead and move on to the third of our data formats, which is YAML. Now YAML is a bit of a newer format from JSON and XML, but you've probably run across it. The first place I ran across YAML was when I was starting to learn about Ansible and building playbooks and plays and working in there because Ansible leverages YAML as part of its domain specific language, the way that you write your Ansible configurations. However, YAML is just a data format language that can be used for anything. Now we've got PyYAML that lets us go in and that gives us this object of YAML, which mimics what we had with the JSON libraries for load and dump. So uh, yaml.load, it takes YAML-based string data and converts it into a Python object, and then yaml.dump will take an object and convert it back to YAML. It was, uh, as I mentioned, mirrored very much after the Python or the JSON ones. Let's see this one in action as well. So we will start out by switching ourselves into the YAML directory. And as expected, we've got a YAML example py and YAML example.yaml file. I'll start my Python interpreter, and we'll begin by importing in YAML. Now, once it's been imported, we'll follow the same patterns we've been using. We're going to go ahead and read in the YAML example.yaml file. And then if I look at the type of that, YAML example, we'll see that it is indeed a string. And now we'll go ahead and print that out. So print YAML example. And I can see that there's the string version. Now, if you're not familiar with YAML, one of the things to notice as you look at it is the fact that it doesn't use uh, a lot of heavy quotes, commas, or curly braces and square brackets to indicate the data format and the syntax. Rather, it leverages white space, similar to how Python uses white space. And so these common indenting, this indentation underneath interface for interface and then over for name and then description enabled, this is how we indicate which keys belong to which objects as they go through. And then the dash symbols indicate lists inside of the content that's there. Now, once I've got access to those, we want to use that YAML library to actually parse the YAML string into a Python dictionary object. So we'll use yaml.load for that. And then if I check the type of YAML dict, we'll see that it is a dictionary object because like JSON, YAML doesn't require order to be maintained. Now I can get access to the interface name that's there by using the dictionary syntax. And this will be exactly like what we saw with JSON. And then I can print out int name, and I can see that I've been able to get access to that very easily. Now to continue our example that we've seen before, we'll go ahead and we'll update our IP address. No different, because that's the value of reading all of these data formats into native Python objects, is that we don't have to worry about changing our syntax. We can take the same type of data, no matter the data format, and work on it the same way. And then in this final example, we'll use yaml.dump to convert the Python dictionary into YAML, which gives us access back to our raw data as it goes through. Very simple to work with. So we'll exit out of that and we'll return back to our content. And we will move on to spreadsheets. And so as mentioned, right, we are, we're trying to get ourselves away. We're using platforms and CMDB and all of these pieces, but oftentimes we'll still find ourselves using spreadsheets and CSV files to store information about our network devices, uh, interfaces, maybe as a source for configuration payloads, and being able to easily read in and make, manipulate those CSV objects is what was gonna take advantage. Now CSV is a built-in library to Python, and we can go ahead and use that. 
Now the way that the CSV reader or the CSV object works is that you're going to create a reader object and link it to an, a file object. And this is done for efficiency. Rather than reading in the entire string like we did with JSON, XML, and YAML, we actually link the CSV reader to a file object and it reads it in one line or one row at a time, which allows us to process very large CSV files without having memory overhead issues. And so if you had a CSV file of logs or configuration details across hundreds or thousands of devices, you can still use your Python scripts without uh, worrying about impacting performance on your host workstation. And so we'll take a look at this one live as well. All right, so change into my CSV directory. And I have a CSV example.csv and a CSV example.py. Uh, Let me find my cheat sheet for my notes here. There they are. So our first step here will be to import. Oop, we got to start up Python. That'll be our first step. So IPython. And then I will import in CSV. Now, we're gonna, the first exercise we'll do here is just open up and read in the entire CSV file just to see the contents. And so this is the contents of our CSV file. It's really simple, three rows, where the first column is the device name, the second column is the device's IP address, and the third column is its location. Now you could have any number of rows and any number of columns. The CSV library can handle that. Um, the next step we'll do is actually, I'm gonna paste in a block of, the block of code that will actually use the CSV library to process this file and we'll talk through it. And so we're reopening up the file with this with open CSV or file name as F. If you're not familiar with the with block, it's called a context handler. And what it does is it saves me from having to remember to close that file at the end, the with block will automatically close it when it's over. And so once I've opened up my file object, I will create a new CSV reader by linking it to that open file object. And then this is where the magic comes in for efficiencies. As I loop over using CSV Python each row and can process the rows one at a time. Now you could use the data from the CSV file for anything you might need, but in my case, I'm doing something quite simple, just printing out a string with information about these devices. So I'm gonna put in the device name in this first placeholder, the device location in the second placeholder, and then finally the device IP address in the third placeholder. And then we're using the, the, the typical dot format string method from Python, and then just replacing and subbing in row zero, so that'll be the first column, so the router one, row two for location, that'll be here, New York, and then row one will be our second column, and we're going zero, one, two, because of the zero index that most programming languages use, as does Python. And so if I run this, we'll see really quickly, it goes ahead and processes those three rows and prints out the data that I was interested in. So exit out of that, and then we will switch back and we will move on to Yang data models. So if you haven't run across Yang or done much with it, what Yang is, is it's an IETF standard, and it's a standard about writing a data modeling language. And we can see a very simplified example of that data modeling language here on the slide. Now a model is that built to represent some common way to, to describe an object. And often Yang models are used for network objects. So how do you describe an interface, as in this example, or an ACL, or a routing protocol? And inside of the Yang, language, it has objects like containers, and a container would group related nodes or make a list of things. So an interfaces container would hold a list of interfaces. And then each object in there will have a series of leafs, and these leafs represent attributes. When I started working with Yang, the term leaf threw me off because typically leaf is spine leaf, but in this case, a leaf is, according to Yang, is simply an attribute about some object that's there. Now, you don't often, as a network operator, need to work with the raw Yang language. Network vendors, software vendors, developers of uh, applications, they work with the raw Yang. What we'll be leveraging is the library pyang, or pyang, to actually manipulate and read in the native Yang file, and then output that in a format that's more apt for us as a network operator as we go through. And so pyang is this Python library. It can be used to validate Yang models, but what we're going to be using it for is to reformat the Yang model in a more easily consumed fashion that works into our network operations and network automation kind of use cases. So let's take a look at this one. I'm gonna change into the Yang directory. And inside of this directory, I have a series of .yang files. These are the actual Yang models. And so the one we'll be looking at is this IETF interfaces Yang. Before we use pyang, we'll take a look at the actual kind of raw. 
interfaces.yang. And so this is the raw Yang language. And I'll scroll through a bit of this and you'll see it's very verbose, which is something that you do need to have when you're working with a data modeling language. But we have to get quite a bit into this before we actually get into the in pieces we're interested in. So here I'll pause and we can see container interfaces and then we get all of the details. So we can see that there's a list, the keys, but there's all of this extra information. Now as a network operator, I wanna know that it's there if I need it, but I need a better way to consume that and understand. And this is where pyang comes in. And so pyang is a command line, you can use it as a command line utility right inside. And so I'm gonna go ahead and run this first one, which is the simplest example. It's gonna say pyang dash F, that's for format. So I wanna reformat a yang model. I wanna format it into its text-based tree format. And then I just tell it the yang model I'm interested in. If I run this command, I'm gonna scroll back to the top because it did scroll past the bottom of the screen. Here's where we started. So we ran this command and then it starts out and outputs here. And so I'll highlight this bit here at the top. And so what this is showing us is this is showing us that we've got the model name, which is IETF interfaces. And then we can see the first container is called interfaces. It is a list of interface objects that each have unique name values that go through. This entire container is actually read write. The RW indicates read write. This is configuration information that's there. And then I can see the data types that are there. This model also has a second container called interfaces state. Interfaces state is RO for read only. This would be operational detail. And we don't necessarily want the ability to overwrite a counter or a, an error uh, stat statistic or something like that, which is why these are read only. Now this is actually a very simple Yang model. There's not much to it. It's a very basic one. It's one I use a lot when describing and working with Yang. But even in this case, there was quite a bit of detail there, more than maybe I was interested in seeing right away. So I've got here, so P Yang dash F tree, so the same piece. And now what I have is tree path, interfaces, interface. And so this is saying display out, but only display this part of the tree. I don't need to see the whole thing. I'm gonna hone in on just the configuration details. And then I've got the same model that's there. And so now I can see that it just prints out that bit that I was after. Now the P Yang has several other examples that you can use that are very useful and getting comfortable with P Yang to manipulate Yang data is there. I've got a note here about a question. Any possibility of discussing use cases using Yang to JSON schema or Swagger API standard using Yanger uh, and PyYang? So the idea here is, is uh, I, if I understand Jason's question correctly, it's can I take a Yang model and convert that into something that's a bit um, native into JSON? Or for me, I actually like the reference to Swagger open API spec. So to answer Jason's question, there's been a lot of work that I've seen both inside of Cisco as well as in the open source community on how to take a Yang model and convert that off. And I've seen several proof of concepts and examples of reading in Yang models and converting them to um, REST comp swagger API specs that are interactive. Um, I haven't seen any that have kind of come up and bubbled to the surface as being kind of fully public, ready to go out there, but I'm encouraged that there's work being done in the open source community, and I expect we'll see a lot of that kind of come through as things continue as they go in. Um, I do think making Yang models more easy to consume for network operators is a critical element of what's needed. All right. So that's the only Yang examples we're gonna run through here just based on the time that's available. So let's go ahead and jump in and kind of continue along into our next section of the presentation, which is to discuss API libraries. Now there are lots of different types of APIs we might work with as network engineers. There's REST APIs, including both RESTConf as well as native REST APIs. There's NetConf, and then of course, there's still CLI interfaces and SNMP that are there. And there are, network, or there are libraries inside of Python to work with all of these. Now I do encourage every network engineer and network developer I talk to, to try to move to REST or NetConf and these programmatic interfaces whenever possible. But however, we all still have plenty of infrastructure out there that doesn't support them yet. So being comfortable with all of these protocols will be important. So our first one we're gonna look at is REST-based or HTTP-based APIs. And so the best library for anything HTTP-based inside of uh, Python is requests. And in fact, if you look at the actual documentation inside of Python's official docs, they actually refer you to requests for HTTP requests rather than URL lib, which is the built-in one to Python. Now request gives us a full HTTP client. It allows us to simplify authentication, headers, response tracking, all of these pieces that are there. And it's great for any kind of REST API call or HTTP request. Now I use this very often when working with REST conf or native REST APIs like NX API, 
or JSON RPC. It gives me a foundation to use all of these APIs inside of my code. Let's look at some code that leverages the request library to work with a REST API for the network. In this case, we'll look at RESTConf. And so this is an, these examples here, so what I've got on the slides are kind of the key elements of the code examples, but the full code examples are available on GitHub and are linked here on the slide, and we'll have reference information for that as part of the end of the video. Now the first bit that we won't need to do here is like any Python script is import the libraries of interest. And so I'm starting out by importing in requests and URL lib3. Now I import requests because that's what I want to use. URL lib is really is actually used under the hood by requests to make calls out. The reason I'm explicitly importing it here is because my lab, and actually like most folks that I talk to, don't necessarily deploy full on um, trusted certificates as part of their, their HTTPS and management uh, planes to their network devices. And so I don't need to do this necessary step here of disable the self-signed certificates. However, if I don't, every time I make a request, I'll get those pop, or, uh, the equivalent of the, the Python pop-up saying, hey, are you sure you want to connect to this untrusted device? I can disable those warnings really easily just by using URL lib3.disable warnings and then which warning I want to disable. I'm not doing all of them. I do want to know if there's other issues, but don't bother warning me about insecure requests. And that's why we're explicitly importing in URL lib3. I'm importing in sys so that I can just make a quick change to my Python path to allow me to import in this file called device info py where I'm storing the credentials, the IP information, all of the details about the devices I'm working with. I find it a good practice to not store all of that directly in the scripts because then I would have that have to update that all over the place. By using a file like device info here, I can just update it in one place across all of my scripts. With that done, I'm setting up some basic kind of starting points for my REST API. The first one here are the headers. And so my REST API is going to have to have some headers that are part of it. Specifically, I'm gonna be making a request and I would like to accept or get back JSON data from the Yang model. And so this is a RESTConf request. So this is an, a, a MIME type that's specified inside of the IETF standard for RESTConf. And so I'll say, give me back the Yang data in JSON. I could do plus XML instead if I did want XML, but I don't. The RESTConf base variable is kind of the starting point for all RESTConf URLs. And you'll notice I've got variable placeholders in here for IP and port so that I can specify and reuse this code across multiple devices if I was making this one script for lots of devices. And then the interface URL is the full URL. So I'm constructing the URL to use that IETF interfaces model to explicitly connect to a particular interface. And again, we see another placeholder here in the string. Now with that through, same script, just second slide, I continue on by creating the actual URL that I'll use. So I'm using the dot format method from a string and then providing it the IP port uh, an interface name that came out of my device that I imported in and the other areas. I will then send a git request. I'm retrieving information from my device over RESTConf. So the dot git request, I can pass in the URL, the headers, the other information. Uh, so I pass it the headers, I pass it the authentication details, so the username and password for my device, and then verify equals false, again, because I'm using a self-signed certificate on this lab device. Now, right after that, I'll do a print r.text. That'll be the raw data that's returned. And in this case, we would expect that to be JSON formatted based on our accept header. And then down here's where I process it. Now request has JSON processing built in. I don't explicitly have to do the JSON.loads. I can just call the r.json and that'll actually read in and process the JSON data and turn that into that Python dictionary that I can then leverage here to actually make the calls and report back what's there. So here's the example. I won't be able to run every one of these API calls just based on time, but let's go ahead and run this first one. I'll switch back here. So I'm going to change up to my device APIs directory and rest. And so I have a handful of request uh, examples in here. We're going to run the first one, which is restconf example1.py. So this makes the request off to the device. And then as we expected, the first bit it did was print out the raw JSON that came back. This was the pre-processed data just to see what we had. And then inside of my script, I turn that into a JSON dictionary or a Python dictionary. And then I just printed out the results of what was retrieved. So we can see it came in as JSON and I went through. So this is putting together my API request with my data format skills that I learned in the last lesson. 
Now if we switch back to slides briefly, we can also see how we can use RESTConf and requests to actually update our configurations, not just retrieve information. So in here, we're looking at the next example, but rather than see the whole example script, we're just honing in on the pieces that are different from what we saw before. And so the first piece that's different is right here. So request conf headers is we're adding an additional header to the REST API call. In this case, we're going to be sending information to the device. And so we're specifying that the content type that we're sending is once again, application yang data plus JSON. I then create a uh, dictionary here called loopback, which holds the specific details about the interface I wanna create. So the name, description, IP, and net mask. So those are placeholders. I then set up a data body. So this is kind of a template that will be used that I can use to put them in. And I can see that I've got IETF interfaces interface. And then for name, I'm pulling this information out of the dictionary on the loop back above. And so I'm building up that same type of I, uh, JSON data body. This in this case is dictionary, but we'll be converting that to raw JSON before we send it off. Now with our data format, our body ready to go, the next step to do is to actually construct our URL, which in fact is the same type of URL format, but in this case, we're replacing the interface name with the loopback name rather than that gigabit ethernet two that we used in our previous example. And then r equals request.put, we give it our URL, our headers are off just like before, but this new piece, JSON equals data, is where we pass in the Python dictionary object and by specifying JSON equals, requests under the hood will actually do the dumps for us before sending. And then in this case, we'll print out the request status code that's there. Um, because when we send a, an update request, we actually don't get any data back. We just get a status code indicating the success or failure. We will look at this one real quick just to kind of follow the full flow. And so Python example 1a script is actually rather than looking for gigabit ethernet 2 like our first example does, it actually is going to look for that loopback address we're about to create to show that it doesn't exist. So when I run this, we see no interface loopback 101 found. And so now if I run Python example 2, which is the script we just looked at in the slides, this will go ahead and create the interface and I get a status code back of 201. In general, any 200 series status code from a REST API is a good one. And then specifically 201 is often used for new objects created or modified as they go through. And so this tells me that everything looks good, but I can rerun that 1A script. Again, this is the one looking for that Python or that loopback 101 for my device. When I rerun this, we now see that I indeed did get back an actual interface information. And we can see the JSON data that was built based on what we sent across as it goes through. So with that done, let's flip back and we're gonna move from REST APIs and REST Conf into NetConf and using NC Client. Now NetConf is um, kind of the most pervasive modern programmatic interface for network devices today. It is built based, it is an IETF standard that's been out for over a decade now. And you'll actually find NetConf implementations on most devices that you look at today from um, most of the software vendors from Cisco as well as all of the other ones that you may be using in your environments. NetConf is also used often by network management systems, both to connect to network devices, and some of them even provide a NetConf interface uh, northbound, so you can interface with an orchestration tool or controller using NetConf. Now, NC Client is a full NetConf manager, that is the client side implementation for Python. Now, we do have a later uh, episode in, Net, or in NetDevOps Live that will dive specifically into NetConf and Yang and these other ones. But uh, for now, just know that this is the client side of this, this protocol transport that we're going through. Now, NetConf works inside of XML and packages up every request in something called an RPC, which stands for Remote Procedure Call. Basically, says NetConf is asking a remote device to per, uh, perform some procedure and then send the details back. And that's what we're getting from here and it does use all raw XML. So we'll be using our XML skills as part of these examples. Now, if we look at our code, so we're gonna look at the same types of use cases we saw with RESTConf, but in this case, we'll look at how it looks at with NetConf and NC Client. So as always, we start out by importing in our libraries we need. So we'll import from NC Client, import manager, that'll give us access to our manager object, and then import XML to dict so that we can work with the XML files that come through. Interface filter. So when we're working with NetConf, we could send a request off for the full configuration. However, most of the time, that's not actually what you're interested in. You're interested in a certain subset of the configuration. And so a filter object is how you, you build up what it is you're asking for. And this is where we reference in those Yang models that we looked at. 
And so we can see our filter object and we're looking for the interfaces container from that IETF interfaces Yang model that we explored earlier in our Yang section. Then we say in here, we're actually gonna filter further down to a very specific interface by providing its name as part of the node definition. Now same script, just separate slide. Here's where we actually instantiate our manager connection. So once again, we're using with the context handler and we're using the with object here so I don't have to remember to type m.close session at the end of the script. Python and the with block will do that for me. So manager.connect providing the IP address, username, password, and just like with um, RESTConf where we're using self-signed certificates for uh, HTTP communication, NetConf runs over SSH, and so it's using the same SSH communication that your CLI interfaces would use. And oftentimes, we again don't deploy out full CA certificates to many of our lab, and sometimes even in production. So his host key verify fault says don't worry about verifying if it's a self-signed certificate that comes back. After that, we customize our filter we looked at by providing the interface name we're interested in, Gigabit Ethernet 2, and then we'll do a git config targeting the running config, passing in the filter. The git config is the actual netconf operation that we're editing or that we're calling. We'll see an edit config in the next example. The data comes back, we get interface equals xml to dict.parse. So we'll parse the raw xml that comes back so that we can then manipulate that using the xml to dict type of uh, syntax that we've used before and then print the details out. Very straightforward to use this and combine the pieces together. Now to save time, I'm not gonna run this example, but we're gonna go ahead and move on to how we could build a code example from NetConf to update configuration inside of our network as well. And so here we're updating our script. So again, just the, the new pieces of information relevant for making an edit. And so the first piece of that is this, rather than creating a filter for NetConf to filter the results that come back, we're gonna create a configuration block. So this is once again is XML details. And so I'm doing a config block and then we're providing it what we want to configure on our device. And so we were outlining this based on the Yang data model and we can see our interface. We've got a placeholder for the name, the description here in the middle, and then the IP and the network uh, mask down at the bottom. So this gives us a reusable template that we can leverage. And our next part, again, same script, just different slide. We take, we create a loopback dictionary with the information about the new interface we wanna configure. And then we go ahead and write, um, we format, we combine our template with the actual loopback detail here in this config equals config underscore data dot format. Remember config data was just a string object with a bunch of placeholders in it. And then we're passing in all the details from that loopback dictionary, unpacking it into the template so that we can create a final version of the configuration payload that's needed. After that's done, we send an m.editconfig. Edit config is the specific netconf operation. We're editing the running configuration and we're sending it our config payload that contains our final details that are there. And then we would print out the netconf status that we're after. So let's take a look at some of this in action as we go through. So I'm gonna change into the netconf directory and so I'm gonna run Python example, netconf example 1a. So like we had before, the 1a example is looking for this new loopback. We don't expect it to exist yet. And so when I run this code, we'll get back a message that loopback 102 not found. But if I run example two, which is what we just looked at to create that loopback, this will push this configuration for this new loopback out we get an RPC okay, true, this verifies that the request was made. This is kind of the equivalent of the status code with the REST API. And if I resend the 1A example, we should now get back our loopback information from our device. And indeed we do. Up here at the top, we see the raw XML that came back. And so this is the data that came back from the NetConf request. We process that with XML to dict. And then we go ahead and we pass it in here with loopback 102 and we can print out the interesting bits of details that are there. So moving from these newer interfaces into when we do have to use CLI, and we'll talk a bit about NetMiko. Now there are several Python libraries for establishing Telnet or SSH connections to different types of devices, but NetMiko was designed specifically with networking in mind, and it builds on top of the common library Paramiko. Now we, I do recommend to users only revert to CLI if no other API is available because it'll be up to you to process that raw and clear text that you have to send and receive because there is no underlying data format that's standardized or modeled that we can use. 
However, NetMiko does support a wide range of vendors and operating systems so that it is very helpful for some of those older devices and deployments you may have in your network. Now we'll look at an example here, same types of examples we've seen before. First to retrieve configuration details with the CLI. So starting off our example here, what does the code look like? Well, we import in from NetMiko connect handler. This is the connection handler to a device that'll establish a connection and allow us to send commands. Import RE. RE stands for regular expressions and it's a Python library for building regular expressions to parse text bodies that are there. And I'll be using that in this example to parse the clear text that comes back from the configuration into usable pieces. Now, there are other libraries and methods that you can do this, but at the basics, regex is a good skill to have if you're going to be doing a lot of clear text parsing. And once again, sys is being used so that we can append, just make a quick change to our Python path to import in this device info Python file that has details about my device. Now, NetMiko does require an additional attribute called device type to know what types of device it's talking to so it can use the right commands. And in this case, it's a Cisco iOS device. I create a very basic CLI template for how to retrieve interface configuration. So show running config interface, and then I would just pass in the interface that I want. Remember, this is a template, and we customize that here. We start out by making our connection handler request. So we're going to open up a connection to our device. We're passing in the device address, the SSH port, username, password, and device type. Now on SSH port, if you're using the default ports for this, you don't need to specify it. But oftentimes in my lab, I have to nat things around. And so I make it, most of my code has the way to specify explicitly what SSH port is in use. But if yours are just using the standard ports, don't worry about that. This command equals, I'm going ahead and taking the template that I created and using dot format for, to string format and insert in gigabit ethernet two for the interface I'm interested in. And then we send that command out using this, the connection handler. And then I can print out the raw interface information that came back. This will be the raw uh, SSH commands. Now I wanna get information out of that clear text and I don't have a data model or an XML parsing object that I can use. So this is where the regular expressions come in. This first step says I need to get the name of the interface. I'll find the name of the interface in some line. So I wanna search for interface space and then everything after interface would be my interface name. Similar for description, description space, anything after that would be my description. Now for IP address information, IP and mask, we need to find the IP address line and then grab first the IP and then the mask. And that's how we do that here. And then we can print out the details that we're interested in. The necessity to kind of use regex or one of these other text filtering and text parsing objects is one of the reasons I highly recommend folks try to lean towards APIs like RESTConf or REST APIs or NETCONF to avoid these types of steps. Now configuring details with Net, uh, NetMiko is just kind of the same, follows the same process. So we would create our loopback dictionary, which has all the dictionary or all the details about this interface we're interested in. So we've got our name, description, and so on. And then interface config, this is the actual configuration set. Now you'll notice this isn't a single text string. This is actually a list object with a series of commands that I want to send one after another to configure this interface. So I'm passing in the interface name, the description, and the IP and net mask into the appropriate lines that are there. Under my connection handler, I open it up just as before. And then my output is send config set using the ch connection handler. Now in this case, this is different than sending a command. We're sending a configuration block. And so this expects a list of commands to send. And you'll notice I didn't have to specify config t. The NetMiko library understands that's the intention by using the send config set command that's there. And once that's done, you could go ahead and print that details out and you would have access to it. So the configuration is fairly straightforward to go through on that. Now moving from CLI into our other classic API interface for the network, we'll talk about SNMP. Now, SNMP has the Pi SNMP library. It's a very powerful library for making SNMP communication in your code, and it supports both gits and traps. However, I will caution you, it can be a bit complex to write and use, particularly if you're new to building uh, Python code and Python applications. There are plenty of examples available that you can build from, and in fact, you'll see in a minute, I use one of those pretty heavily. The data that comes back are custom Pi, uh, Pi, Pi SNMP objects that you work through on them. Um, so we can't simply just parse that into a dictionary object or other pieces. Well, we'd be, we would be using the Pi SNMP objects for it. So our example to make a simple SNMP query is here. 
Now, as I mentioned, I took this pretty much word for word directly out of the Pi SNMP docs um, because of just how it works to go through and making sure that I hit all the pieces. So the process starts by creating an iterator object. And the way SNMP works, if I'm sure everybody's worked with SNMP before, you get a bunch of details back and you need to kind of process through it. We call that MIB walking in these types of pieces. And if we were to load up the entire return data at once, we would likely overwhelm our Python code and potentially our workstation that's running it. So by creating an iterator, we kind of loop over one at a time as we go through in there. And so I'm using the git command that comes out of the Py SNMP library, and then it's an SNMP engine. I target a particular community, uh, UDP transport protocol, so the address I'm going to, the port that SNMP is running on, uh, context data is just a general object we pass in, and then here an object type is where we identify the details about the MIB and the information that we're interested in. Now, once we've created our iterator object, we call next iterator on it to actually make the initial query to our device. And that returns back four pieces of information, error indication, error status, error index, and then finally var binds. So three of the four relate to errors you might occur. And then we process through those and give you the ability to go in. Now, this is a basic example, one of the simplest for SNMP, and as you can see, it's, it on its own is a bit complex, which is why I typically try to use other APIs if possible and whenever possible rather than trying to use SNMP. But when you do need it, it is good to know that the library is there. So we're moving into the home stretch here, and I want to talk a bit about some configuration management tools and libraries. So, so far, we've been talking about API libraries and, and interfaces that allow us to work with raw data or raw API calls. Here, I've got four different Python uh, open source projects that are targeted at network configuration as frameworks or as tooling that goes through. And I've broken them up into two categories. So Napalm and Nornir are network libraries, Python libraries designed for network automation. And so these are libraries that you can use inside of Python scripts. So you're writing Python code and leveraging these tools, and they understand how to work with networking capabilities and go through after that. So they're designed for the network, and they're very efficient. Very, um, Napalm's been around for a long time. It's very mature, used by lots of folks. Nornir's a bit new, but we've seen some really good positive um, feedback from folks that have taken a look at it. On the other side, we have Ansible and Salt. Ansible and Salt are configuration management DevOps tools written in Python that were originally designed for server automation, but have had network automation capabilities added to them kind of over time and as they go through. Now, with both of those, because they're configuration management tools and not necessarily Python libraries, you actually don't work in Python. You work in what would be their domain-specific language or DSL. With Ansible, that's a lot of YAML files or what you're going through on there. And these are four examples that go through. I want to talk about two of the more common ones that folks go through in a little bit deeper. And so Napalm is this very mature Python library for multi-vendor interaction, and it's very robust. It's been designed and tested by some very large networks and is in use in production all over the place, which makes it a great tool to start working with because it's not necessarily um, something you're going to be learning along with everybody else from the brand new. Tons of examples that you can build on. Now, it supports lots of ability to deal with configurations, and that's what Napalm is all about, is dealing with configurations that are there. And it uses available backends. Now, most of the interfaces it's using for these devices is actually using CLI and SSH to connect and send configuration pieces. But there are some devices and libraries that are using newer interfaces like NXAPI or NetConf to send these pieces. What's interesting about Napalm is lots of other tools actually are using it under the hood. So inside of Ansible, you can actually leverage Napalm rather than a different network configuration library to take advantage of the, uh, what Napalm offers rather than building it out. And similarly, Nornir can actually leverage Napalm for sending the actual configuration pieces that are there. Next, we've got Ansible. Ansible is definitely the leading DevOps tool for network configuration management today in this open source space. And the ones that it goes up um, is categorized with would be Ansible, SaltStack, another Python one, or Puppet or Chef, which are written in Ruby. Now, Ansible is the one that most network engineers are using today and experimenting and learning with for a lot of really good reasons. It's an agentless piece of tool, which means I don't have to install an Ansible bit of code at the edge devices. It leverages typically SSH or CLI connections or a native API like REST or uh, NetComp to go through. It also supports both old and new platforms so that you can use both CLI and these other interfaces. And because it's so popular, there's a huge set of examples and network modules that you can use to communicate with your different devices that are there. 
So we don't have time to show examples on all of these, but in the code repository, there are some available to look at. And then finally, I want to introduce you to two very cool Python utilities and libraries that I think every network engineer can take advantage of. The first one is Viral Utils. If you used Vagrant um, before, Viral Utils is like Vagrant for the network. If you've never used Vagrant, that doesn't mean anything to you. And so the description here is you've probably heard about or used Viral or CML. What Viral Utils is, is a command line wrapper around Viral that lets you very easily work with your network simulations in a NetDevOps framework. Um, I'm going to show this real quick because it's easier to see it than to talk about it. And so if I switch over here, what I can do is with viral as a command line utility, I can simply say viral ls to look at the different simulations that are running in my viral environment. I can viral nodes to get access to the actual devices that are there. And I could viral ssh into dist1 to very quickly jump in. Now I've used viral for years as well as other network simulation tools for learning, but the use cases today are less about learning and more about implementing them as part of our network configuration pipelines that are there. And for, uh, to make that easier, viral actually supports viral generate, which allows us to very quickly generate inventory files for Ansible, PyETS, or NSO based on our simulations that are there. And the reason that's important is when you spin up a new simulation, you don't necessarily know what IPs will be assigned. And so in this case, if I take a look at default inventory, this is an Ansible inventory that was automatically created based on using that viral generate command. So it creates my uh, Ansible inventory that I can use as part of my Ansible playbooks that go through on there. All right. so. Back to slides, um, I highly encourage folks taking a look at Viral if you're using these simulation tools as part of your pipelines um, on that side. And Viral Tools makes it quite easy to work with. And then our last bit I want to go through here is PyATS. PyATS is a new free and heavily open source. The entire PyATS is an open source, but all the parsers, the communication pieces, those are open source so they can be communicated and added to by the community. And what PyATS provides us is this tooling that allows us to profile and test our network during, before, and after changes. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're about to do a configuration change. The process you would use with PyATS would be to profile your network, learn about the CPU status, the memory status, what interfaces are up, the health and status of protocols like BGP or OSPF or HSRP. You then make your network configuration change and you use PyATS to reprofile your network and look for the differences. And then if you see any differences that indicate problems, you can process from there. We compare this to the typical way we look for problems after network configuration, which is just waiting for our phone to ring from some application guy that tells us the applications are down. We need better ways to test our network configurations and network status, and PyETS is a great option provided by Cisco for completely free to start building these types of uh, tests into your use cases as you go through. I highly suggest taking a look at PyETS as well as you're building more robust pipelines. So as we get to our final five minutes, let's summarize and see where we're at here. So what did we talk about? We've actually talked about a lot of information in here. There are a ton of Python libraries that are relevant for network engineers. There is no way I could put them all into a single presentation, but I grabbed some of my favorites and ones that I think are great to get started with. So we started with our data libraries, things like XML to dict, JSON, PyYAML, so on. We looked at how we can use API libraries like request to use REST APIs or NC client for NetConf, and even how NetMiko and PySNMP allow us to build Python scripts around these more older interfaces that are out there for those cases when we need to use them. We explored a few of the different configuration management open source frameworks, so Napalm and Nornir are Python network automation libraries, as well as configuration management tools of Ansible and Salt we talked a bit about. And then at the end, we explored a couple of Cisco Python libraries that are, again, available for free for you to make put into your NetDevOps pipelines to go through on that. So from a references perspective, all of the information that we've kind of dove into is available here. So links to a site dedicated to Python up on DevNet. I've highlighted a handful of learning labs to help folks get comfortable with Python, as well as some of the APIs that are there. And if you don't have infrastructure running these APIs, take advantage of our DevNet sandboxes that are available. I highlighted two, one for iOS and one for NXOS that are always on in VPN lists that you can immediately start making API calls to. And then all the code samples I went through are available at cs.co slash code Python networking. And I'll make sure these links get posted on NetDevOps Live so you can find them. And then finally, now that you've gone through this presentation, you've done some of the learning labs, I wanna issue a code exchange challenge. If you're not familiar with code exchange, it's an 
online repository of Cisco relevant open source um, code examples from GitHub. So you can find it at developer.cisco.com slash code exchange, and anybody can submit their projects that relate to these types of topics. And my challenge coming out of this presentation today is I wanna see everybody use one or more of the libraries we talked about in today's presentation to write a Python script that makes one of your networking tasks easier to do. So as an example, but I don't want everybody to build just this example, but we all have always come up across this time when we have to compile Mac and ARP entries across our entire network. And using some of these libraries can be very easy to do that. So had to go to it, open up a GitHub repo, start coding, and when you've got it functioning, go up to CodeExchange and submit it. And then be sure to tweet me and at NetDevOpsLive up on Twitter so we know that it's there and we can take a look and let everybody else know that it's, that it's there and you can get some credit for all of the great work you're doing in this space. And if you are looking for more information about NetDevOps in general, be sure to check out NetDevOps on DevNet. So developer.cisco.com slash NetDevOps for all things NetDevOps or slash live after that for information about all of the videos and series seasons, both past shows, recordings, as well as registrations for new shows that are coming. And then we've got blogs and video courses available. If you do have more questions, please stay in touch, both with me as well as Cisco DevNet. We're available on all the social medias, uh, Twitter, Facebook, all of these areas so you can go through. And in conclusion, thank you so much to everybody for joining us today for season one, episode one of NetDevOps Live on handy Python libraries for network engineers. Be sure to follow NetDevOps Live on Twitter at NetDevOps Live. We'll see you on our next episode. Thanks.